We continue now in the Gospel according to John, picking up where we left off back in November before entering the season of Thanksgiving and the season of Advent. We pick up in the 15th chapter at the very first verse. Listen now for the Word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch that withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from the Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands, so that you may love one another. Friends, this is the reading and hearing of God's holy and eternal word. May God bless it to our understanding and to our use. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I felt a little stupid for having done it, but honestly, it wasn't the first time and probably won't be the last. I was careful in taking each of the strings out of the box in which they had been packed since last year and gentle in removing all the snags and tangles that tend to develop in the strings when they're packed away in a box for a year. And then I plugged each of the strings into the wall, hoping that the ball would shine forth in light and so save me the tedious task of replacing each bulb in the string with one that I know works looking for that one ball that's preventing all the others from shining. And so I was greatly relieved when each of the strings lit up when I plugged them in. So it was time to wrap them around the tree. I started at the top and worked my way down slowly, pausing at the end of each string to plug it into the next one and continue on down the tree. When I got to the bottom, I made a few fine adjustments looking for gaps and empty spots. And then I plugged the string in, expecting to be able to appreciate the beauty of my handiwork, only to find a large dead spot in the middle of the tree. One of the strings was not lighting up. And so I didn't escape that tedious task of replacing each bulb in the string with one that I know works, searching for that one bulb that's preventing the others from shining only to get to the very end of the string and discover that I'd forgotten to plug that particular string in along with all the others. 
It's amazing what a little electricity can do for a dead spot in your Christmas tree. It can fill it up with beautiful and glorious light. This morning, Jesus doesn't talk to us about Christmas lights and electricity for obvious reasons. But when he does talk about vines and branches, I think he might be saying something quite similar. I am the vine, he said, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. The point, I suppose, is as, as fruitless as it would be to wrap Christmas lights around a Christmas tree, but to never plug it into the power source, so it would be for disciples to try and seek faithfulness without remaining anchored in the power and presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think at this point it may be useful to remember the context for this exchange that Jesus is having with his disciples. We left off at this point in middle November for the sake of the season of Advent. So let me remind you of the circumstances into which Jesus spoke these words. Jesus and his disciples are still in the upper room where Jesus has washed their feet and celebrated with them the Passover feast. After the meal, he began to talk about betrayal and identified Judas Iscariot as the one who was going to do that betraying. And with that, Judas had left the group, leaving the disciples to wonder and fear and consternation. Then Jesus began to talk about leaving them or more plainly to the fact that he was going to be taken from them. But with the bad news, there came some good news, because in his going away, he promised that he would come back for them, so that wherever he was, they would be also. It was into this context that Jesus began to talk to them about abiding in him, staying connected to him. It was in this context that Jesus used the imagery of vines and branches to talk about the kind of relationship that he wanted to have with the disciples going forward. And it was into this context that the disciples' confusion must have grown. Abide in me as I abide in you. How do you do that, Lord, when you say that you are leaving us? The branch must be connected to the vine. How is that possible, Lord, when you say that the vine is going to be uprooted and cut away? In our passage from John 14, as it continues on, Thomas voices that kind of confusion as Jesus says and talks to them about being the way, the truth, and the life. He tells them they know the way to the place that he's going, and Thomas says, we don't know the way, the where, how can we possibly know, possibly know the way? Giving Jesus the space to enter and to utter one of the essential truths of our faith. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I think in that moment, Jesus wasn't just answering Thomas's question. If we don't know the where, how can we know the way? I think he was also preparing them for the answer the next question, the questions of abiding, the questions of connection when his physical presence was going to be taken from him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way that Jesus spoke of is the way that he lived his life. The truth that he spoke of is the truth in which he lived his life. The life that he wanted for them was the life that he himself was currently living in their midst. One thing about Jesus that still stands out as startlingly, startlingly significant today, as it must have seemed then, is the perfect consistency between his words and his works. He didn't just talk about humility, but he lived it getting down and playing with the children on the floor and washing his followers' dirty feet. He didn't just talk about mercy, but he lived it, giving everything within himself to address the needs that surrounded him. He didn't just talk about compassion, but he lived it, 
emptying himself out for the sake of the pain around him. Someone asked him, what was the greatest commandment? Jesus told them, love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. But he didn't throw those words around lightly. He didn't throw those words around loosely. He said the greatest commandment is love. And then he loved with everything inside of him, including his very own life. I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me as I abide in you. How do you do that? His followers might have wanted to ask. You're going to leave us. How do you do that? We still might want to ask today, some two millennia later, in the, in the face of the stress and the strain and the trials and the struggles of the culture that surrounds us. How do you abide in something pure and holy when it is so, so hard? Love, Jesus said, is the how. My commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one more than this, and one laid his life down for his friends. We know that at that moment Jesus understood where the road before him was going, that the cross awaited him, that his life would be taken from him, and that he would freely give it up for our sake. Why? Because love is the way. Love is the one great truth. And love is the life. As we enter into this new year, we seek to be plugged in to that which is our power source. We seek to connect ourselves to the one who is our life source. And so we renew ourselves in our commitment to continue on loving in 2017 the way that we have been loving and serving in the years that have gone by. And so we'll gather again to feed and shelter homeless individuals. We'll continue to fill backpacks. We'll continue to support crisis ministries through Fish and through the, our own outreach funds so that when people call desperate, broken, and in need, we'll have an answer for them, an answer that says, you are not alone. And as we love in all the ways that we have been loving, we will look for new ways to love, new programs to launch, new methods to reach out into the community, to communicate to those that are lost and broken and in need, you are not alone, that God is with you, that we will stand by them. And so this morning we gather. We gather to worship and give our thanks to God. We gather to plug ourselves into the reminder that we have been loved wholly and completely and perfectly. We gather to remind ourselves that in being loved, we are set free to love. We gather to commit those who agreed to stand before us in those efforts to love. Emily, Betsy, Nancy, Camilla, serving those already on the board following in the footsteps of those who have served before them. At the 11 o'clock service, we will set them apart with prayer, and as we set them apart, we set ourselves apart in a renewed commitment to be plugged in to this coming year, so that the light of love, the light of Christ our Lord, will not just shine in our hearts, but will shine in our community to the glory of the God who gave his Son so that we might live. So as we enter this year, we step back and consider, how can we love? How can we shine? How can we bear fruit? Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we rejoice and give you thanks for your love this morning that calls us to this place, that claims us, surrounds us, heals us, renews us, and commissions us to go forth in the name of our Savior, to love as we have been loved. So, Lord, pour your spirit in us now and renew us for the work of the gospel. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.